It's the trial of the century, and O.J. Simpson's socks take center stage. Did Nicole Brown reach out a bloody hand and touch her ex-husband, leaving a stain on his sock after he attacked her? Or did racist police officers pour blood on them? I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ25. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Ullman, Mr. Blazier, Mr. Newfeld, people represented by Mr. Darden, Mr. Goldberg, and Ms. Lewis. Morning, counsel. The court had indicated that I would hear the motions regarding the uh, KMBC news telecast and the subpoena for a KMBC news broadcaster to testify on this matter. We'll take that matter up this morning. Well, uh, we suggest uh, calling Tracy Savage to the witness stand uh, to see if she uh, declines to reveal the source and uh, uh, we will then proceed with a showing of why the assertion of immunity should be overcome in this case. Good morning, Ms. Sager. Kelly Sager appearing on behalf of Tracy Savage, who's a reporter for KNBC Television. And we have filed a motion that I understand the court has received and reviewed to quash the subpoenas directed to Ms. Savage on two grounds. That is, we understand that the only two things that the defense is seeking from Ms. Savage are to reveal her confidential sources, we think is protected under the First Amendment. There was an area downtown outside the courthouse called Camp OJ. It was called Camp OJ affectionately because everybody had to literally camp out there. It certainly, as I understand the defense's theory, this information is sought simply for the purpose of establishing some possibility that there might have been some conspiracy to frame the defendant with respect to the planting of blood on the socks found in Mr. Simpson's bedroom. The identity of the sources of a KNBC news report broadcast in September is certainly not direct evidence of any conspiracy. Everyone was looking for scoops and everyone was looking for something new. Everyone was looking for something that nobody had. It's very difficult. All of uh, what uh, KNBC has already told us about their source uh, points very clearly to a strong possibility that the source came from within the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is the important fact that the defendant is seeking to establish, that the broadcast of this information on September 21st coincided uh, with activity within the Los Angeles Police Department that would only be known to sources within the LAPD. Sources confidently predicting results of tests that have not even been performed suggesting that that confidence may have come from knowledge of the source of the blood that was being tested. But what Ms. Savage's testimony would do for us uh, would be uh, to present direct evidence that it did indeed come from the Los Angeles Police Department, so we no longer have to rely on an inference. If someone who was directly involved in the testing themselves was in fact the individual who was responsible, if there was an individual, for the alleged leak. How is that relevant, or is that at all relevant, for the purposes of this threshold requirement that the defense must make? And we say that it isn't. As to the motion to quash the subpoena for Tracy Savage, the court will deny that motion. On September 21st, 1994, uh, did you broadcast a news report related uh, to the case of People versus O.J. Simpson? Yes, I did. And uh, in that news report, uh, did you report uh, information with respect to 
uh, some socks that had been allegedly recovered from Mr. Simpson's bedroom. That's correct. All right. And what did you report about those socks? I reported that the socks had been discovered at the defendant's home and that there was blood on those socks and that the socks had been tested, the blood on the socks had been tested. And the results showed the blood belonged to Nicole Brown Simpson. There was both a camaraderie and a cutthroat attitude in covering the OJ case. We all covered the trial, pretty much covering what you see is what you get. But then we were also looking for the element that the jury wouldn't see. Now I take it that uh, in making that report, uh, you were reporting uh, what you believed were accurate information? I reported accurately the information that was given to me from multiple sources. All right. Uh, how many sources? I'm afraid I cannot answer that question that is protected by the shield law. We weren't trying to change the outcome of the trial. We were trying to put what the jurors were hearing into context with what the audience would get to hear. We could present things that, that the jurors would never hear because what, we weren't worried about whether something was admissible or not. We were wondering, is it true or not? Which is very different. The rules in the courtroom are not the same as the rules in real life. Now, did you make any promise uh, to these sources that their identity would be kept confidential? I gave my word as a journalist that I would not reveal their identities. How do you define generally knowledgeable and close to the investigation? Your Honor, I'm, I'm afraid by identifying how I determine what knowledgeable is, I may in effect um, reveal the identities of my sources. Knowledgeable, I think, in all due respect, I think the word speaks for itself. <laughs> Did your sources include any officers or agents of the Los Angeles Police Department? I respectfully decline to answer that question. I must assert the shield law. Nothing further. All right, thank you, Mr. Allman. He has published an article. What's the uh, publication? Penthouse Magazine. Your Honor, Mr. Bosco will offer testimony that he also was a recipient of similar information, that he is a professional journalist, and he has published an article uh, that reported the same information that reporter Savage has just testified to, and that he will confirm that he uh, is a recipient of information from a source that told him that DNA test results uh, were in on the socks that were recovered in the bedroom. When? And se se about the same date, September 21st, and that that information came from a member of the Los Angeles Police Department who is uh, known to him as a badged member of the police department and a person who is active in this investigation. All right, do you have, uh, this is published information? Yes. And what's the uh, publication? Penthouse Magazine. Do you have counsel, Mr. Bosco? I think I know the issue well enough to take the stand because I've been through it before. Whatever, I, I'm not even nice if I call him, so maybe my mother will do so watching the television. <laughs> <laughs> or my wife, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> is allow the defense to call Mr. Bosco for the purposes of this 402 hearing to establish the foundation, one, that he, uh, the nature of his employment, uh, two, the, uh, his authorship of the article in particular, uh, three, um, that uh, he did in fact report the items that are contained in those two relevant paragraphs, <clears throat> and then I assume somebody will ask him to divulge the name of that officer, and then he will invoke the shield law. Mr. Bosco, available? Yes, he is, Your Honor. We call Joseph Bosco. Your Honor, may I be present in his sign? You may. 
Thank you. 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 Thank the Penthouse magazine issued June 1995. Yes, sir, it was. Did you write this paragraph, and were the facts that you wrote uh, true and accurate at the time you wrote them? Paragraph reads as follows. There has been enough leaking out here to sink Camp OJ if it were on a barge. With the story that blood on the socks found in OJ's bedroom was a DNA match with Nicole's. This time, however, the officer offered no cooperation and became angry and defensive when asked. A number of journalists turned him down. Apparently, KNBC did not. Was that truthful, sir? Yes, sir. Was it accurate reporting, sir? Yes, sir. Nothing further. We can show you the truth in news, but it may not be admissible because it may be hearsay or it may be tainted in some way, but we leave it to you to decide. But the jury wasn't given certain information we could give that information the jurors couldn't hear. Would it be fair to say that a lot of what you're writing in this paragraph is your opinions as opposed to uh, facts that you learn from some source, whatever the source may be? No, I do not believe that would be an accurate. Um, of, the, of these two paragraphs? Yes. No, no, I do not believe that that would be accurate. We knew more than the jury did. And, but you always have that in a case. Here you just saw it live. Can you tell us whether this certain police officer told you that he had called a number of journalists? Again, must invoke the reporter's shield law of all due respect. So you cannot tell us whether this information that I just read to you represents a single source as opposed to multiple sources? I can tell you that this is a fair and accurate representation of what I wrote. And beyond that, I must again respectfully invoke the reporter's shield law. All right, Mr. Bosco, thank you very much, sir. Thank uh, you, Your Honor. You are subject to uh, recall. All right, let's proceed to the uh, Michelle Kessler issue. Uh, my understanding is the defendant wishes to call Ms. Kessler uh, to testify first to the normal things, that she's the uh, lab director, and then there are the other issues regarding um, leaks of information. This case was given a special designation of a confidential case, was it not? Yes. Okay. And um, as a confidential case, are certain different procedures set up to maintain security uh, of the testing of evidence and for the results of the testing of evidence? As for the testing of evidence, uh, no. The testing is still done under the same process. The laboratory only shares the results with the investigating officers and with the prosecutorial agency. That, that doesn't change either, other than the results are held in a separate secured area, usually a supervisor's office. And who were the people at the investigating agency who would be entitled to be told what the substance of the report was, had they asked? No foundation. Uh, the lead investigators, Tom Lang, Phil Van Adder, it felt so charged outside, so tense, that I remember running into um, detectives Van Adder and Lang and talking to them. They were gonna go back to the, to the LAPD headquarters. And a couple of us reporters ran into them and said, you know, I don't know if you should go outside. I just feel that our employees have too much integrity and honesty and have been involved in many, many cases before, and we have never been a source of any leaks. Are you aware that on September 21st, it was reported in KNBC that DNA typing on the socks 
had reached the conclusion that the blood on the socks was consistent with having come from the Cole Brown Simpson. Assumes facts not in evidence. Oh, well. Officer calls for your sake. Oh, well. I believe it was the day after. the actual stain itself, did you, sir? Of course not. Mr. Neufeld, you may call the uh, defense next witness. Defense calls Herbert McDonald. In connection with your work in this case, did you, on April 2nd of 1995, conduct an examination of the socks, which are commonly referred to as item 13, socks recovered from the bedroom of Mr. Simpson? Yes, I did. And when you examined that sock, did you specifically examine an ankle stain, which had already been DNA typed consistent with Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes, I did. In your opinion, Professor McDonald, is the ankle stain that you saw a spatter stain? Not based upon the examination that I made of the socks at that time. I did not find any distribution of blood that I could consider a spatter. In your opinion, sir, what type of stain was that blood stain? Well, that was a transfer pattern resulting from, I'm quite sure, but not positive, a compression transfer. A lateral or swiping action is the other possibility, but on the dark socks, I could not see any evidence of a feathering out on either side. Take those socks, lay them down flat. Blood patterns match on both sides. There's only one way you can do that. If I splash blood on the sock, and on this side and on this side, patterns shouldn't match. Set them down, they match. The blood patterns match. Only one way that can happen, you gotta set them down, pour blood on them. Our evidence proved that Officer Van Adder had taken the test tubes with the blood of O.J. Simpson and the victim and had taken the blood from the test tube and poured it on the sock like this. And so, if you look at the sock, you see that it has the blood splatter on this outside. It has the same blood splatter on the inside. And then the identical blood splatter, lighter of course, on the third side. So you have, and fourth side. So you have mirror images on all four sides. That couldn't happen if the sock were being worn by the killer at the time the splatter hit the sock because the leg would interrupt the mirror image flow of the blood. What you'd find then is you'd find a mirror image here, a mirror image on the inside, and then a transfer image. That photograph, do you recognize that photograph? Yes, I do. What you're saying is, is that, the, that what makes this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of stain as opposed to a splash or spatter is that uh, the blood is only hitting the, the, the upper portions of the fibers, is that correct? That's correct. The red areas are where blood is on the top of the fibers. The white area, if it had been projected, would be also stained. So it's just on the surface. The overall inch by inch and a half stain is seen on the surface. And when it's cut out, there is on the inside of the side opposite, it'd be the inside here, if we turned it inside out. This is where there is transferred liquid that's dried. And I interpret that as being part of the staining action here at the time this was wet and went through. Assume that a doctor examined Mr. Simpson head to foot on June 15th, and there were no cuts, scratches, or scrapes observed on Mr. Simpson's ankles. Would what you observed on the sock when you examined it 
both with the naked eye and with the microscope, be consistent with a blood stain passing through one side of the sock to the other when the sock is not on the foot and is instead lying flat on a surface. Yes, it would be consistent with that. Oh, well. It was in the nature of blood spatter, not blood being poured on the socks, as someone seemed to suggest. You said that you had seen other more convincing evidence of it, referring to spatter. I can't listen and read at the same time. The person who looked at that and thought they were round spots is mistaken. They're not spatter. They look like it? flying saucers and donuts and trapezoids. They're what not round. What is it? Your objection, please allow the witness yes. to finish the night. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, then what is it? I don't know. It looks like it was uh, transferred in an irregular fashion. I don't know the mechanism. But it was blood spatter consistent with what we know from the crime scene because we see Simpson's shoe prints in the blood and by virtue of that creating exactly that sort of uh, blood spatter. And you never examined the, the piece of fabric that was the center of the stain, correct? That's correct. Wouldn't it have been of some assistance to you, sir, to look at the inside, the center of that stain, in making your estimate of how much blood was actually in it? I don't believe so, no. The stain was as saturated as I believe it could be, right up to the outside of the cutout portion. Uh, if you're going to suggest the center was in some way void, then that would have been interesting. But I think they cut it out because it was the heaviest stain to do their testing on. You think, but you don't know. Well, I'd be pretty stupid if they took a void. You didn't look at the, the actual stain itself, did you, sir? Of course not. And so what you're telling us, when you're telling us what your estimate is of the amount, is your best guess. Isn't that right? It's an educated guess based upon experience, yes. It's Nonetheless. A guess. It's an approximation. A guess. Estimate. I think that we proved that blood was planted on the sock. It makes it impossible to evaluate the integrity of the prosecution's evidence. If someone wearing the socks that you saw were to step near to the body of the victim, Nicole Brown Simpson, near enough for the ankle bone to come in contact with her bloody hand, could that cause a compression transfer? Certainly. Could it also cause a swipe? Yes. If Nicole Brown Simpson reached out a bloody hand to touch the ankle of the murderer wearing those socks, could that cause a compression or a swipe transfer? Certainly it could. It's simple transfer. As OJ-25 continues during the 28th week of testimony, blood evidence is key to the prosecution's case. The defense is working overtime to prove it was tainted or planted to frame OJ Simpson. Did you take any notes at the time that you made your observations of this sock to document what you saw? Yes, very, very few. Dr. Lee was described. Did you take, you personally took notes, sir? Yes. Very. Did you turn them over to the defense? Yes. They can turn it over to the prosecution. No, they have not. All right, we'll take this up later. Proceed. All of this stuff is unfolding. There's all of this evidence. It's coming in every... I mean, it's just like times of infinity. So in an ordinary trial, there's jabs and there's pressure and there's tension. Multiply that times a gazillion. In front of the jury, Ms. Clark uh, erroneously represented to this jury that the prosecution did not receive the notes of Professor McDonald from the April 2nd visit um, an inspection of the socks. Um, that was just flat out wrong. I'm not going to attribute a motive. I have no idea what was in her mind, but it's flat out incorrect. Now, with respect to the discovery violation, Your Honor, I was deceived. The witness referred to notes. I've never seen any notes. She has really, I mean, I think it's just completely inappropriately um, tried to prejudice Mr. Simpson by suggesting to this jury that the defense did something tricky in not turning over those notes. Mr. Newfield stands before you because the witness characterized something as notes that no one else would so characterize 
and because I'm taken by surprise by that than questioning him about it because I see something I've never seen before. To make that kind of remark in front of the jury is incredibly reckless uh, and is a reckless disregard for the truth when she should know better that it warrants a monetary sanction as well. And stand before you and say that deserves monetary sanction. First of all, those words should never leave his mouth. How and much do you suggest? I suggest $250, Your Honor, which was the last sanction she received. I could play the same game they're playing, and, pick, and every nitpicky little violation, I demand sanctions, and I demand they be put in jail, and I demand they be held in contempt. I don't do that. I don't need to do that. I can just practice law. I can just try my case without playing these, these little games here about nanny, 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 and neener, neener, and who's got the, word, word, who's got the not last sanction? Who's going to pay money this time? Your Honor, all I'm... I just, I just feel that perhaps I reacted to her and what she did here because of the suggestions and her request for sanctions against me on earlier occasions. And, and she's right that it is said that, that that has to be the situation. But it is in that context that I made that remark, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are next going to exhibit to you a videotape of Mr. Paradis's testimony during the preliminary hearing. You will notice that there is one blip in the tape. It is an edit of some material that I ordered uh, removed from the tape before it was played to you. Sir, can you tell us what you do for a living? I'm a registered nurse. You're a registered nurse? Yes, ma'am. And are you qualified to draw blood from people? Yes. Were you so employed on the date of June the 13th, 1994? Yes. To on June the 13th, 1994, remove a blood sample from someone you recognize in court today? Yes. Who are you referring to that you took blood from in this court? Oh, yes, the defendant. I was there when the blood was drawn. It was drawn by a medical professional, drawn by a, uh, a male nurse. Tommy was, had been doing this for 40 years. He, he does this all the time. Did that leave the test tube then secure with the blood in it? Yes. And what did you do with that vial of blood? I handed the tube to Detective uh, Van Adder. Thank you, sir. I have nothing further. Yes. Do you remember, uh, sir, which arm you drew the blood from? <laughs> The right arm. Did you put any preservative in the tube? The preservative was already in the tube. Did you check that before you put well, Mr. Simpson's blood in? It's in there, and it's understood that it's in there. And this preservative is called EDTA, and I don't know what those initials mean. Nobody in this case planted blood or any other evidence, and there's nothing to show and no evidence to show that they did. Simple as that. Your Honor, I had, a, I had the occasion to speak with Mr. Cochran briefly. Uh, he told me that he had a chance to listen to the tapes, that there were Furman's voice on the tapes, that the tapes were disgusting. Mr. Cochran, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, I would like, if I could, to um, put something on the record at this point, as I indicated to the court earlier. The court is aware that um, last week the court was kind enough to issue a subpoena for Ms. Laura Hart McKinney in, in, in North Carolina. And I had the pleasure of journeying to North Carolina on uh, Friday morning, uh, where I was able to read uh, transcripts and listen to uh, a very small portion of uh, the tape. Uh, there are some 11 or 12 hours of tapes, Your Honor, regarding Mark Furman. I argued uh, strenuously, Your Honor, that after having heard uh, the portion of the tape that I heard, and I can represent the court, it was uh, Detective Furman's voice, and I can tell the court that these, these tapes and these transcripts were from a period April of 1985 
to July of 1994. In addition to using racial uh, epithets uh, and slurs against uh, blacks and Mexicans and, and women, uh, Detective Furman talks about his philosophy, disagrees with the LAPD philosophy. He shoots to kill, not to stop. Um, he talks about arresting people simply because they're, they're Justice should not be thwarted by uh, some bizarre uh, decision by a judge in North Carolina under these circumstances. So we're not just going to take it laying down, we're going to move ahead. My request then today is to make the record clear of how strongly we feel about this. And how this man, the bottom line is, he's committed perjury. Should be investigated by an office other than the district attorney's office because of their, uh, their uh, alliance with this man, perhaps the attorney general, perhaps the U.S. attorney. Someone should investigate this for perjury. The police commission has to look at this because this whole aspect of uh, everything that took place here, this is frightening and it's extremely serious. And those of us who heard this in that courtroom were chilled by what we heard and what took place. And so what I'm asking the court to do is assist us in getting uh, this information, and I think perhaps um, a declaration, further declaration regarding materiality might be the way to go, Your Honor. The famous F. Lee Bailey questions, you know, I, I, I don't find any solace in knowing that I could, uh, I could answer half the question, but then again, I never even thought of the tapes. That response is only a legal one. I don't know if this court um, can really make a declaration based on the representations of counsel not having heard the tapes yourself, Your Honor. I don't know, legally speaking, what the, the proper uh, response of this court could possibly be without firsthand knowledge of the material in issue. Um, my review of the transcript to date um, indicates to me that there was a consistent position taken by the author that this was a screenplay that Mr. Furman was requested to adopt a character for her in helping her to write this fictional account. This is not a documentary she was writing, Your Honor, it was fiction. And, and my understanding was that uh, Detective Furman was furnishing fictional material for her as a fictional character. So I think that is important to the consideration of whether or not it's material, and I think the court should know. What the, what the matter is before uh, adopting any position in terms of a declaration to oppose a, uh, another court. The court issued the subpoenas under the interstate compact and there is a procedure that this court and courts in the receiving states follow. And I, I cannot in any way criticize that ruling from this vantage point, nor do I think it's ever appropriate for another judge to comment or criticize the rulings of another court especially in matters that are pending. It's unethical and it's inappropriate. When we talk about a search for truth, this is the truth. We got his own voice, it's not anything anybody made up. It's his voice, his words. And so uh, I think that uh, if you would even just reaffirm your finding of materiality uh, in light of the, uh, these facts on the tapes, I mean, I think that's what we need. And I want you to give you some time to think about it. We want to get back to the jury. You'll think about it and then um, not rule at this point. You're never precipitous, and you wouldn't be now. And think about it. Let me see if I can provide you with something additional. Well, so after all, we're talking about your subpoena that they fail not to give. I didn't have a subpoena. It was yours, Your Honor. And so, that, so from that standpoint, I think uh, we have an interest in doing the right thing here, being well, honest and, and pursuing the truth. So, Mr. Kagan, we have to put this into perspective. While I have the benefit of having sat through this trial every day since June the 22nd, so I know something about the facts and circumstances, um, that court heard the tapes saw the transcripts and talked to the parties involved, the author and her counsel. So that judge has more information than I do about the particulars. The whole case was predicated on this, that I planted evidence because I was racist. So which comes first, the chicken or the egg? In your judgment, how serious is this problem of contamination that you found at the Los Angeles Police Department? It's extremely serious. Proceed. Mr. Clark. What this proposed testimony by Dr. Gertis specifically relates to, and that which we are asking this court to preclude, in particular is an examination by Dr. Gertis 
of PCR DQ alpha typing conducted in the laboratory at the Los Angeles Police Department. We found concrete, overwhelming data about the inadequate procedures at the Los Angeles Police Department, the inadequacies of their controls to detect contamination, their inability to understand that they had contamination and what to do about it, their gross violation of every uh, fundamental procedure and protocol of running a competent DNA laboratory. This is the heart of our defense to DNA evidence, okay. particularly the Bundy blood drops, the glove, the Bronco. How important is DNA evidence to the prosecution's case? I dare say it is a key element of their proof. John Gertis, J-O-H-N-G-E-R-D-E-S. <clears throat> What is the importance of something known as a septic technique, and could you explain what that is to the jury? Well, aseptic technique or sterile technique is the foundation of microbiology, really. It is a, uh, it's basically teaching you the common sense of how to handle uh, an item, a specimen, in such a way that you can look at what's only in the specimen and not worry about other microorganisms that are floating around in the air falling in there and confusing what you're looking at. What you do in preparing for to win a case is find those preconceived notions that people will have about a case and what do they need in order to start striking down the other side's position. And frankly, that was done very well by the defendant. Could you please describe what this represents? If you look at all the strips that are done on a given day, if you, you can look at those in the context of one another and make a scientific decision as to whether or not this is true contamination or not. If you look at that all in context and look at the whole pattern, it's, you can confirm that this is, this is not just a random thing that happens at a low percentage of the time due to this DX artifact, it's really contamination. How do you cause that doubt? How do you supply the people that want to believe your position with, here are, here are the problems associated with that, not how do I support all of that? In your judgment, how serious is this problem of contamination that you found at the Los Angeles Police Department? It's extremely serious. Is the LAPD, in terms of levels of contamination, worse than any other forensic laboratory you've ever seen? Definitely. By far. Court TV's trial memos kept during each day's testimony were often clinical analyses of legal strategies. In this case, the trial memo breaks down what was often complex and technical testimony. The battle of the experts phase of this trial began Wednesday with a defense DNA expert criticizing the police lab technician's work as sloppy and contaminated and the prosecution's DNA expert's work as unreliable at best. The jury will be left with the question of who might have a bias and which experts were more convincing in their theories of whose blood was where after the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. Is it a good idea to handle reference samples from suspects and victims in the same period, in the same location? No, it's not a good idea because of, again, the risk of cross-contamination. Are you familiar with Mr. Yamauchi's testimony that in processing the Rockingham glove on the morning of June 14th, that he did not routinely change laboratory paper between those items? Yes, I'm familiar with that. Is that a sound laboratory practice? It creates unacceptable risks. When handling blood swatches, when you're taking them out of test tubes, one should change the paper. Well, if the swatches are going to touch the paper, I would say that that would be a good idea. But if they're not allowing the swatches to touch the paper, 
then there really isn't any reason to change the paper beneath them. There is cross-contamination of uh, Mr. Simpson's blood into Nicole Brown Simpson or Ron, Ron Goldman. Jurors tend to take evidence and they, they will twist it to fit their story of the case. Um, they will forget evidence that they've heard in a case if it doesn't support their position on the case, or they'll even use it and refer to an expert or a, or a witness that was for their side, their, the position they wanted to support um, in order to make, to make their decision the right decision. Juror number six in the Simpson trial is Lon Cryer. He kept a personal journal and meticulous trial notes, over 600 pages in all. He is sharing them publicly for the first time for this documentary series. Claims to have found blood on socks seized in Simpson's bedroom on 6 94 The prosecution makes this great claim, and then the next thing you know, the, the defense comes around and picks apart exactly what their contention was earlier. So it was like you go back and forth, back and forth as far as for how you were taking everything. Dr. Gerties, with regard to those samples, and I'm referring to the swatches that were never extracted by Colin Yamauchi. They were never subjected to cross-contamination that you have described that can occur during the extraction of DNA process, correct? They were not subjected to that at that third step in the process. I'm referring to the DNA results. They all could have come from Mr. Simpson, correct? In terms of what is reported as results? In yes. terms of what was reported by the LAPD. So items 48, 50, and 52 all reveal DNA results by the Los Angeles Police Department consistent with Mr. Simpson. Yes. As far as Cellmark was concerned, they tested all three items as well, didn't they? Yes. Those results were all consistent with Mr. Simpson, correct? They were. As far as items 48, 50, and 52 by Gary Sims in the Department of Justice, those results were all consistent with Mr. Simpson, correct? That's correct. All right, Dr. Gerties, would it be fair to say that the vast majority of the $30,000 that your laboratory has billed in this case, or will bill, was spent looking at the validation studies by the Los Angeles Police Department and not the specific facts and acts in this case? I don't think that would be fair to say, no. The prosecution's DNA evidence is being shredded by the defense as the People versus O.J. Simpson continues to unfold. Coming up, World-renowned pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden takes the stand in O.J. Simpson's defense. Mr. Kelberg, human beings are not able to be studied like uh, worms or something. We can't do controlled studies of cutting people's necks. That's next on O.J. 25. I'm Roger Cossack.